Welcome to Strengths of Acids and Bases. In the last video, we saw that the pH of a substance is dependent on the H plus concentration, or the hydrogen ion concentration. And we've also looked at how an acid, like hydrochloric acid, HCl, dissociates to give off H plus ions and Cl minus ions. By contributing this H plus into a solution, the acid is able to lower the pH because it increases the H plus concentration. So increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions made it more acidic and therefore lowered the pH. And you can see from this ionization of HCl that for every HCl molecule we get one hydrogen ion and one chloride ion. So if I have a one molar solution of HCl, I'm going to get a one molar concentration of H plus ions in solution. But not all acids are the same. This one molar HCl will definitely lower the pH of a solution that I added to. But how does that compare to one molar acetic acid, the acid that's found in vinegar? So let's compare these two acids and see what happens. We just said that one molar HCl lowers the pH of a solution. Now we're going to compare that to the one molar acetic acid. And there's basically three things that could happen. The one molar acetic acid could have the same change in pH as the HCl. It could result in a greater change in pH or a smaller change in pH. And if we write out what acetic acid is going to dissociate to, we'll see that it also gives off one H plus ion and the acetate ion. So for every one molecule of acetic acid, we get one H plus ion, according to the way I have this equation written. And if this were true, you should expect it to have the same change in pH, because the same concentration of acetic acid as HCl is going to give me the same number of hydrogen ions produced. So I should have the same lowering of pH. But as it turns out, we don't see the same change in pH. And what we actually see is that the acetic acid gives a smaller change in pH than the HCl. But why is this? I had the same concentration of each acid. I had one molar hydrochloric acid, and I had one molar acetic acid. So why am I getting different results if I have the same concentration of acid? And the answer to that is that not all acids are the same. We have strong acids and we have weak acids. Hydrochloric acid is an example of a strong acid, whereas acetic acid is an example of a weak acid. And this idea of strong versus weak is based off of one factor, and that is how completely the molecule dissociates or ionizes. So we'll look at the HCl first. Hydrogen chloride, when dissolved in water, is going to yield H plus ions and Cl minus ions. But we say that this completely ionizes. Every single HCl molecule dissociates into these ions. None of them stay together. So whatever concentration of HCl I start with, I'm going to have the same concentration of H plus ions. And this complete ionization is what makes this a strong acid. So then a weak acid, on the other hand, does not completely ionize. So if we look at the acetic acid and see how it dissociates, we're going to see that it does produce H plus and the acetate ion. However, it doesn't completely. Not every single molecule it dissociates. So what we end up with is an equilibrium. So I'm using a double-sided arrow to show that this goes both ways. The H plus and the acetate ion can reform to make the original molecule. And we never use up the original reactant. There's still some of the acid left. Not all of it will become H plus ions. So the reason this is considered a weak acid is because it does not completely ionize. It instead reaches an equilibrium. So this idea of how completely the molecule ionizes, how completely the acid ionizes, that's going to separate strong acids from weak acids. And it's worth knowing a few examples of strong acids that are very common. HCl is one really common strong acid. But we also have sulfuric acid, H2SO4, which you should always recognize as strong acid. And the other very common one to come across is nitric acid, HNO3. So these are a good three common strong acids to remember. And when you see these, you'll know that they dissociate completely, which means that it's actually pretty easy to figure out their effect on pH when they're added to a solution. But it's not so easy to see that with a weak acid. So how do we know how many hydrogen ions this acetic acid or any weak acid will produce? In other words, what's the effect going to be on pH? What's the effect of a weak acid on pH? And to do that, we have to treat this as an equilibrium. So we know how to write KEQ constants for a reaction. 
But for an acid, it has a special name. It's Ka, the dissociation constant for an acid, or the acid dissociation constant. And we essentially set up Ka the same way as KEQ. We do the concentration of the products, so what it is for acetic acid, H plus ion, and the acetate ion, the concentration of these products, over the concentration of the reactant, which is this acetic acid molecule. And for acetic acid, the Ka just happens to be 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. The Ka values are known for many acids, and you can find these Ka values for acids in just about any textbook or online reference source. But you could also find the Ka yourself if you knew the equilibrium concentrations of each of these three things, these two products in this reactant. Now the actual Ka number is not going to be terribly important right now, but what is important to know is that a larger Ka means that there is more dissociation, and that should make sense because for Ka to be large, the numerator has to be large in this fraction, so there has to be a high concentration of products. And if there's more dissociation, it's a stronger acid. Now note I said stronger acid, not strong acid. Actual strong acids like HCl and nitric acid and sulfuric acid, these have incredibly large Ka's so large that we don't actually have numbers for them. They're just considered very large. So when I say stronger acid, I'm talking about comparing different weak acids. A weak acid with a higher Ka is stronger than a weak acid with a lower Ka. So Ka is an invaluable way of comparing acids. And in a later video, we're going to see how it relates to creating or choosing buffers. So that's the rundown on acids and what makes a strong acid and a weak acid. But what about the strength of bases? And for bases, everything we just talked about is true as well. It's a very similar case. Just like acids, there are strong bases and weak bases. The difference between them is the same as in the acid case. A strong base dissociates completely. So NaOH is an example of a strong base, a very common example of a strong base. And it's going to completely dissociate into Na plus and OH minus. Other examples of strong bases are potassium hydroxide, and calcium hydroxide. And there's kind of a nice rule of thumb about strong bases. The OH ion, the hydroxide ion, when combined with a group 1 or group 2 metal, is usually going to be a strong base. So you can see that potassium, calcium, and sodium are all either group 1 or group 2 metals. So strong bases are typically group 1 or group 2 metals with hydroxide. An example of a weak base, on the other hand, is the NH3 ammonia molecule. And this only partially ionizes to NH4 plus and OH minus. And just like we did for the acids, I can create an equilibrium expression for this. So NH4 plus, one of the products, the concentration of the products are multiplied together, times OH minus concentration, over the concentration of the reactant, which is NH3. And for the acid, we called it Ka because it's the acid dissociation constant. For bases, we call it Kb, and this is the base dissociation constant. And it has the same meaning for every case. The higher Kb means the stronger the base is. The lower the Kb, the weaker the base is. And just like Ka's, the Kb's have been determined for a number of bases, and you can look them up on a data table. The Kb for ammonia, for example, is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. That wraps up our lesson on the strengths of acids and bases. Write down any questions you have in your notes and bring them with you to class.